Today is the 30th day of October 2014, and we are with Dr. Alok Pandey once again. And Alok, the subject tonight is the efficacy of prayer. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we can begin with that great line from Savitri. A, a prayer, prayer a, master a master act, act, a king idea, can link man's strength to transcendent force. Then miracle becomes the common, common rule. rule. One great, one great act. And one mighty deed can change, change the course, the course of, things. of things. Yes. Of course, um, these famous lines uh, have a certain background. Savitri who reaches a point where she has to make a choice, a crucial choice. And it's uh, very beautiful that in making of that choice, she goes deep inside and brings out uh, the soul strength. Then these things really, you know, uh, work out. She, she has an indomitable will and as he says that a, a will stood in the, you know, engine of the... In the course of yeah, the driving the wheels. of the driving yeah. wheels. So uh, essentially, uh, when we speak about prayers, you know, several images come to my mind. <clears throat> because very often, uh, reading Mother and Shobindo, the amount they have spoken, especially on prayer, surrender, uh, aspiration, faith, that one expects that, you know, I make a prayer and immediately something happens. So, <laughs> well, it can happen. It very often does happen. But then there is a background to it and um, I think uh, as I said several images come to my mind. One of them is of course the parrot like prayer. We all, uh, we all you know pray, there are some standard prayers which have come down the lines. And just like the mantra there are two of its kind. One is which have been activated down the ages because human beings have invested a lot of their heart and love and soul into it. And these prayers are really very powerful, even when they are done very mechanically. In, in all cultures, I remember once, for example, uh, reading the serenity prayer. You must be well aware, yes, you know? yes. grant me the uh, serenity to accept the things I cannot change, yes. the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. I remember first time when I read this prayer um, in my passing out year of final year uh, medicine, it touched me very deep, just reading that prayer. Now that power came because the person who uttered it. Um, and then over the centuries, I think it's a 13th century prayer, uh, it has been charged with the soul aspirations and soul vibrations. We have similar prayers uh, in Sanskrit, host of prayers. Uh, and they can really have a power to uplift you. But still, there are a whole lot of prayers which are simply parrot-like. Sometimes, you know, I have strange experiences with regard to this and I'll just share two of them. One was uh, way back with little children while interacting, I had gone to interact with them and naturally the teacher asked them to, uh, you know, recite a prayer to Mother Saraswati. And they had done their job well, they had remembered everything, they didn't want to, you know, make any mistakes and the tabla and the harmonium and the prayer went on. <coughs> Since uh, it was a freewheeling discussion, so I started with the meaning of the prayer. Uh, obviously children had no clue about you know what they, were, they really mm -hmm. spoke. Over a period of time, through that one hour, one and a half hours, we <coughs> got to that point where they began to understand who Mother Saraswati is who they are invoking, why they are invoking and they had a beautiful image in their mind and the discussion, all discussion was only on that. At the end of the discussion, we said let's pray again, the same prayer but this time with full awareness and full, you know, consciousness about what we are doing. And no more rote. Absolutely, ah. it was such a beautiful presence, ah. atmosphere. <clears throat> concretely, I mean everybody could feel it right into their bones. There was another experience which I had which is the other kind. This was beautiful with the children who you know 
invoked and they we all felt a lot of teachers had come the difference between a prayer done mechanically and an invocation done with full consciousness the other was in one of the conferences where some children came from a veda school where they are teaching the vedas and you know you know vedas are been preserved by an oral tradition so these children belong to that tradition and naturally you know it's customary there is some you know conference where different people are going to speak on different spiritual subjects so we start with a vedic invocation now the children came they were all clad in children means adolescents they were all clad in white dhoti white spick and spotless shirt and or kurta with you know those things tied to the hands and a mala and they spoke the vedic prayer with gestures you know the gestures were absolutely uh, suiting the mantras mm. and invocation but it was a totally lifeless parroting they were reciting some of the most powerful mantras which have a great evocative power and they were all correct in their intonation correct in their gestures but it didn't have the power to really evoke the presence so it set me it it opened a door to a new kind of revelation that look there are seekers i it came in my mind in this way you know we'll come to the prayer part but it came like this mm -hmm. that there are seekers of truth who discover truth and there are custodians of truth who guard truth now you know custodians are very often like they don't know the treasure they are guarding it's like you know there are watchmen on the door of let's say a bank mm -hmm. he doesn't know what kind of treasures are inside what people have kept in the locker and they are guarding he doesn't really have the treasure with him and yet he is necessary to that work you know nobody can spare him at the same time there are those who know the treasure and have the treasure with them so parroting a prayer is very often it has been taught it has been helpful to preserve a truth down the generations there are custodians as i said of truth but to a seeker when this prayer touches a seeking heart and a seeking heart in a state of seeking utters the same prayer it has a very powerful effect so to start with i feel you know a lot of people they remember and even children are taught some lines from savitri some lines from prayers and meditation it's all right i mean it's 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 a, it's a good thing better than probably doing all kinds of nonsense but the real prayer is not a parrot like prayer but a prayer which you know really rises from the depths of the heart and as shubhendu you know, says on a crest of emotion in between there are several bird like images that come to my mind which you know uh, describe different forms of prayer another bird like images of a crow now what does a crow do i see it in the nursing home you know it comes to pick up a piece of something and it comes hesitates goes back comes hesitates goes back so prayers which are full of doubt now they don't bring a desired result unless like a crow we are persistent because you know ultimately the crow succeeds only because he is very persistent persevering it doesn't give up comes back goes back goes back and forth so one is a parrot like prayer where one is simply reciting the other is where there is some objective in in mind but there is the mind is full of doubts will it be granted will it not be granted there is lot of agitation in the inner field lot of excitement wow if it is granted so i think uh, it's much better if the field in which the prayer is rising is made calm otherwise it's like in aircraft which doesn't take off because the whole field is full of storm and turbulence so it's very important to stay calm yeah. and you know that gives the image of a dove which you know flies into the air beautiful white dove may not be able to fly very far but whatever it flies is is beautiful so there should be a lot of quietude inside to really pray prayer is not a state of agitation and excitement that oh i'll go and pray and you know one is full of um, uh, will it want it oh it must be granted maybe you know and then one starts looking for signs within half an hour one hour it should be granted if not maybe the mother has not heard my prayer maybe uh, it's not it's all you know uh, not true so in that state of mind the prayer doesn't even rise high above to you know reach the source which it is meant to connect 
a third kind of prayer which is very interesting is uh, you know the prayer of a like a vulture sits on top but asks for a piece of meat down below you know this was ramakrishna paramahansa's uh, analogy uh, yes and i have found this very interesting that we go to the divine divine mother you know what is it that she cannot grant i personally believe you know everything is possible but we end up asking for what maybe some promotion in our life maybe we have some money issue <laughs> maybe we have some relationship problem all right we can ask she doesn't mind because as you have been say the divine mother wants that the child soul goes to her so that she can pour her indulgent heart of love but how much more beautiful if we can pray for you know freedom from ignorance freedom from desires one is praying for granting of desire other is praying to get free of desire get free from the ego and that kind of a prayer is a very rare prayer very powerful and it gives me the image of a swan going far far high up on wide wings not you know encircling round the earth uh, you know eyeing on some earthly good but invoking the heavens but this prayer which like a swan rises up and goes right up to the source to the abode of you know the giver of all boons and brings down that purity that light or lifts us up to dwell there in that state of consciousness that's a wonderful prayer and uh, uh, you know with this image just to yes. complete the image yes. uh, there are two more images one which is like an eagle it knows what it wants is clear precise and goes to the target and mother has said at several places that you know if you have something in mind say it clearly very often we say mother let thy will be done but deep inside you know i want this mm -hmm. uh, so mother says say it in front of the divine mother what is there and we can say it and then leave it at her at her feet uh, or we can simply say that mother i want it but obviously we must know that surrender implies that the result whatever may happen may not happen whether the divine grants it or doesn't grant it or grants it and we have a contrary experience than what we expected that is obviously all in the hands of the divine so along with prayer there should be a surrender and if there is no surrender very often prayer turns into you know a means to make us more and more um, you know despair and feel frustrated because we feel we prayed to god and we you know things didn't happen our way well uh, as shobindo says that it's not like a machine mm. where you put a prayer and out comes an answer yeah. in fact he said very beautifully all prayers are heard but not all may be granted and that beautiful line in savitri which is one of my favorite uh, heavens wiser love rejects the mortal's prayer yeah. you know <laughs> so yes. there is a wisdom which grants yes. grants because Uh, i guess you know as shubindo says in the early stages of schooling the divine grants our desires and that's an aspect of the divine we all love we ask for it and he grants us but there is another aspect of the divine where he rejects our desires we want it and he doesn't in fact he takes away something which we dearly cherish you know and that means actually that our yoga is maturing our prayers are maturing our sadhana is maturing the divine contact is maturing because he feels we are no more in the kindergarten stage where lollipops are given we are in a stage when the divine feels so close to us that he can take away that little lollipop in our hand which we are so <laughs> dearly attached to but how much more difficult uh, for an average human state condition when we are in our ordinary state that look you know i prayed and till now mother was granting everything now you know she doesn't seem to listen i would say she is uh, probably uh, not only probably she is listening much more carefully but now she is she is taking interest not just in granting something to us but in our progress and mother used to say there is a difference between a devotee and a disciple so she says a devotee you can be anywhere and you know by an act of faith you can be a devotee protection can be anywhere received by you know that kind of faith inside but to be a disciple she says ah things become difficult after that you cannot afford to make you know 
a small error because it begins to bring lot of consequences because the, the divine is taking our yoga very seriously. He is not just left us at the stage of kindergarten where we play and the teacher plays and everybody plays and it's all wonderful. Things are getting serious. So I suppose the result of the prayer also changes as we grow in our consciousness more and more. When we begin to grow, we begin to realize that those things which the divine would readily grant. Well, now he has taken a different approach altogether. He doesn't readily grant some of the things which we still want. But he grants other things a lot more easily. Peace, quietude, he grants a lot more easily. Uh, when I came here early, you know, very often it would happen. And I think it happens with many persons. You feel the weather is uh, hot and, you know, suddenly it will cool down. There is rain. Then you feel, uh, oh, I wish I had some cholas. And that very day, the you know, dining room will give some cholas. And, you know, you feel, ah, this is bliss. <laughs> and uh, it actually happened with me that, you know, I got these uh, mm -hmm. uh, things which I wanted. And I was very happy about it, obviously. Then at one uh, moment, once casually I mentioned, you know what? Uh, I know the mother, you know, loves us so much. And anything that she gives, uh, I'll receive it very happily. And I will eat it as prashad. And sure enough, that very day in the dining room, there was, uh, you know, this thing, bitter goat, karela, mm -hmm. which yes. is the one and only thing which I just can't eat. And it opened a totally new door. I said, mother, this is the simplest way that you have taught me something. <laughs> that look, I mean, and, and then, you know, you begin to enjoy the divine play. And then, of course, there is this... Uh, but anyways, if we have something in mind, we should say it very clearly. We should pray very clearly with clarity, not with confusion, doubt, turbulence, storms, excitement, uh, with clarity and surrender at the feet. And that calm. means yeah. calm. The consciousness should be in a state of transparency. Not that we are praying for this, but hiding something else. One example, for, for instance, is when people speak of mother's work or they want, you know, oh, if I have so much money, I'll give it to mother. So I want to do mother's work and therefore I am praying for money. Now, I had a very funny instance about it with some, some, some sadhak. He prayed like that and he, he went into share market. Mother has spoken not, not favorably about it. Uh, so he went into, I mean, just for the sake of completion, share market and mutual fund, they are very different things. But anyways, people, this person went into share market to make a lot of money. And he prayed to mother, mother, when I get money, I will offer it to you. I am going for that. Obviously, uh, it's it's a quite evidently deception because we are not expected to offer more than what we have. So if I don't have money, I am not expected to offer money. But anyways, he went and he kept on making money. It started with few thousands and it went on to 10 lakhs. And he was very happy. Till now, he has not offered. <laughs> and then suddenly, you know, some chit fund thing came and he suddenly felt, oh, if I give this, I will make a lot, lot of money and it will be how nice if I can offer a crore at her feet. <laughs> he gave that 10 lakh and it crashed. Gone. He lost everything. Yeah. <laughs> like the gambler of Monte Carlo. But the story was the divine had a, you know, play. So when we conceal, how nice if we could have said, well, mother, I want money or I, I think I need money, mother, or simply that, look, I have a desire for money. I don't know what to do about it. I'm offering at your feet rather than, you know, hiding it behind the so-called ambition mm -hmm. of serving the divine or doing good to the divine. So, you know, this kind of a deceptive cloak is very dangerous, especially in yoga, any kind of deception, mother's work and hidden behind is an ambition for, you know, I'll be famous, I'll be great, I'll be someone special, I'll be a yogi, I'll be a superman. And Shubhinda said so often that yoga is not to be done like that. To become a supramental being is not an individual achievement. It is so that we can relate with the divine better. Because when we do it as mental beings, we do it through the veil of ignorance. And it's not a you know, perfect relation. For perfect relation, the consciousness also should be transformed. Then the relation is perfect. So for perfect bhakti, for perfect service, for perfect knowledge, the being must be transformed.
If it is not transformed, the relation is not perfect. So even a prayer for the transformation is not a prayer for aggrandizement, but so that I can know you better, serve you better, love you better, without the veils of the ego, desires and ignorance. That's what transformation at its bottom is about. And then finally, you know, the image that comes to my mind is when I read the mother's prayers and meditations. It's amazing. It's a path. And what a path. The whole path is opening through prayers. And um, she had achieved everything through that. Shurabindu speaks of that. That, you know, she had already realized the supramental truths. And Mother says so beautifully that whenever he would tell me an experience, I would say, ah, but I already had it. <laughs> and I have noted it on this, this date. And then Shurabindu saw these, this diary, prayers and meditations. And he asked, you know, to publish it. And as we know, there were five volumes and ultimately many of the prayers mother tore away and burned them, which were of a very personal nature. Now personal is not a limited personal for the divine, but who knows the whole story of creation. And Prithvi Singh had yes. written to Sri Aurobindo and said something to the effect that it was not mother praying but yes, teaching yes. us how to pray. Yes, yes. There are two, three things that uh, Shubhinda wrote. One is that she is showing us how, the way of the psychic, yes. how to aspire and pray. And the second he said, she is praying in identification with the earth consciousness. And that is there in the prayers, that she is not praying just for herself. Yes. She is praying for the earth, identifying with the earth. Earth is, there is a silent prayer of the earth. It's not strong enough to reach, especially when it is burdened with the uh, Asuric darkness. And the divine identifies with the darkness, touches the core, awakens it, and becomes one with earth and prays. It's something amazing. In fact, he also, when Sri was asked that, how is it that the mother being divine is still praying? So Sri takes a leaf out of Indian mythology. He says, well, the divine praying to the divine is a well-known phenomena. And he gives the story of Rama who prays to Lord Shiva. Now it's very interesting this story just to you know bring that thing in perspective. Rama is an avatar of Vishnu and he is uh, someone whom Shiva prays to. Shiva you know whenever he Rama is on earth I mean Vishnu is on earth he keeps on doing pranam and says Sachidanand Brahm, Sachidanand Brahm. Whereas he is uh, you know going about like a normal ignorant human being. And so he prays to Lord Shiva that I am going to do this deed of, you know, killing Ravana and in that process many kinds of things are going to be demolished. So he prays to Lord Shiva to grant him the permission to go ahead because, you know, you can't do such an act without the divine sanction. He also prays to Shakti and this is a very interesting story that when he is wanting to invoke Mother Durga, mm. so he is told that, well, you have to offer a lotus at her feet. But where to get lotus? Where to get a lovely flower? So he says, well, my mother used to say that uh, my eyes are like a lotus, Kamal Nayan. So here I would offer it. But naturally, the mother appeared. Now, this is very interesting that uh, when the divine is upon earth, because this is the third aspect of mother's praying, when the divine is on earth, he has to do things negotiating through a whole field of play of forces which have manifested in the earth. So a miracle is not a miracle made to order where he will just overrule all the play. There are conditions as Sri says of the play. But very often people ask, well mother and Sri are omnipotent, omniscient. Why don't they just put a magic wand and suddenly transform all of us? So wonderful. <laughs> we won't deserve it. That's a different part because <laughs> it's an evolutionary uh, you know, process. And the evolutionary process is so that through the field of time and the play of forces, we can become ready to deserve the grace which is anyways always with us. And you know, that's the effort, as I said, to deserve the grace, to become worthy in the sense Grace doesn't make that condition, but we will not be able to receive it rightly. It may go into our head. It may make us feel egoistically great. Instead of making us humble, granting of a prayer. You see, when prayer is granted, it can have both effects. One effect is, it makes us more and more humble. 
that look how great the divine is full of that love and glory that even to a you know nobody like me he cares in the minutest detail the other is how special i am i prayed and she granted i am special so you see the effect <laughs> very often it's like homeopathic medicine and shubhendu said yogic force is like homeopathic medicine that the same thing which cures is the same thing which can cause a disease <laughs> and vice versa so granting of a prayer also the divine sees the balance of forces the right time and if the time is not right he prepares us even when he is granted it cannot be given straight away there are so many instances in in uh, uh, i mean take the whole mahabharata draupadi prays in that state of anguish because she has been disrobed humiliated and in her it's a symbol of womanhood and she prays at that moment her heart is all fire that this entire kuru clan be destroyed because you know this is the kind of kings who cannot even safeguard a woman's modesty and so contemporary nowadays you know with the with the way yes. people are treating women yes and obviously this prayer is granted as we come to know much later but look at what happens in the course of time so much preparation so much bloodshed 13 years of exile and through that so many challenges and difficulties and shubhendu brings that in the essays on the gita that when somebody the divine has chosen as an instrument time to time he will intervene but by and large he will choose to stay behind and allow us to go through the crucible of purifying suffering so it depends in a certain stage he allows us to go through a state of purification which suffering can bring and mother has spoken of that that divine whom he regards as his friend he he can be very severe with them with prakash ji in dining room who is now no more you know it's very interesting when he was struck with parkinson's disease and uh, somebody asked him that you have been such a sincere worker um, actually you know he was wonderful like from morning till night and he would work he was involved with everything he knew everything and at the, at the same time such a gentleman yes amazing so how come you are struck with parkinson's disease and he gave a beautiful answer he said you know this is the best gift that the mother has given to me for my sadhana this is a yogic approach yes, yeah. people ask this even about pavitra da yeah. why did he have this cancer of the bone well those who have gone to a point and i have seen this in, of course vir prakash is an exceptional person i know of another person who was in the ashram for 2 years then he left and went to uk and you know he started his own center and he was struck with a paralytic stroke and after that his life chased course and he became more and more and grossed with mother and shubindo and their work and he just uh, shared opened out with me spontaneously without my asking anything because i didn't have any such doubt you know whatever mother does yeah. or whatever happens in the play not that the mother does it but if she sanctions it it's meant for a progress so he on his own said you know what i was a very restless man all the time running about this and that take out my car and go here and there and the mother made sure that now i stay at one place and go within and so she sent me this and he laughed it was amazing he was happy about it that look you know now i am compelled to sit at one place and really go within and it has brought me so much closer to mother and shubindo now you know if any event can bring us closer to mother and shubindo it's worth it any event is circumstance so here we have something very unique and amazing in mother's uh, you know prayers where there is so much of surrender so much of detachment from the ego self that she is saying what do circumstances matter how does it matter whether one is supposed to be at the center or the periphery or one is supposed to be an instrument or not i am happy to be at your feet to dissolve into you to be reconstituted and this prayer the only image that comes to my mind i mean a prayer which i think once in 1000 years or 2000 years take place is like the phoenix you know phoenix is the symbol of the avatar the yeah. bird she 
comes from above, goes into the fire, mm -hmm. totally consumes herself and then rises up. So these prayers of the mother teach us how to pray. To pray for this thing, that thing is alright at a certain stage and maybe to an extent, like mother has said very clearly, uh, there is nothing wrong in asking for physical health, praying for physical health, just as we ask to remove a moral defect. If I ask to my anger to be removed, which is a very valid yogic prayer, why not about a physical disease? Perfectly valid. But the real prayer which teaches us how to dispel the ignorance, break the bonds, liberate me from these chains, what prayers? Oh, I may be before thee like a blank page so that thy will may be written on it. A few moments passed in silence before thee are worth centuries of felicities. Or that small one. O oh Lord, teach me to be an instrument of thy love. Such a small prayer, pregnant with such power and force. In St. Francis, teach me to be an instrument of thy peace. Yes, absolutely. I mean, these are the prayers which, which really can be called as prayer. I mean, as the Gita says, four categories of human beings turn to the divine. The first two are of the, you know, inferior kind of bhakti. This is also bhakti. And that is arth and artharthi. So arth is somebody who suddenly is besieged by a trouble and distress and prays in a state of intense anguish. And it is immediately heard and sanctioned. One is in real distress. I mean, I'm sure we all have had such experiences. I have had quite a few where intense prayer at a point of time brought in instant result. Everything got arrested, saved, uh, something which could have been catastrophic. Catastrophic. There was not mm. even a bruise. Mm. One of them, of course, was uh, very interesting when uh, my wife had head injury. And it was, uh, I mean, it's a strange sight to see suddenly how she landed up to nursing home. That was also mother's grace. And at that point of time, I was, you know, there was nothing else which I could do except sit down and say, Mother, she must be saved. That's all. And then within, it's not a voice that I heard, but like a suggestion, which I felt where the mother is asking me, what if her soul wants to leave? And the answer that goes from me to her is, no, Mother, you are the Supreme. You can always <laughs> reject what the soul wants <laughs> in that state. And then, well, things took a certain course and the doctors said that. They said, you know, it is like everything as if got arrested. There were fractures, there was bleeding inside. And they say it was like touching that dangerous spot and it has got arrested. And he was amazed that with such fractures, with such a bleed, she has really come out so well. It was really grace, you know, that was a state of art. I don't know what to do, so I'm just calling her. <laughs> and plenty of such things have happened in all of our lives where there is a sudden intervention and things either get arrested, they change the course, and what could have been catastrophic takes a different course. But there is another prayer. Again, an ignorant prayer, but on the lesser side, it's an artharthi. I want something and I pray for it. You know, seeking something which is also a kind of bhakti, but on the lower side. But then there are two other prayers which are really the prayers of sadhaks. One is a jigyasu, a seeker after truth, seeker after knowledge. We see some of the mother's prayers are just like that. And finally, the jnani, one who knows the knower of the divine yet prays. And that we see in mother's writing. So she says, always the command is turn towards the earth. She would want to just melt into his bliss. It's so easy for her. But then the command is something else and she obeys it. How beautiful those prayers are. The prayers of the knower. Sure, those one aphorism is like that. Where he, it's a Vedic prayer where he says, um, you know, be wide in me, O Varuna. Be pregnant and solemn in me, O night. Be voluptuous in me, O Bhaga. 
be auspicious in me, O Indra, be wise in me, O Brahmanaspati, like that. And at the end he says, liberate me from all these gods, O Kali. The final act of liberation. So, you know, there's such beautiful ways to pray and mother her own prayer. She says how, how many times, even as a child, she would invoke mercy and kindness and you know in agenda this whole you know her prayers which are so simple and direct uh, oh lord god of kindness and mercy oh lord god of wisdom and peace like that it goes on and on she says particularly kindness and mercy because she was to embody grace she says that i have not come to embody justice yes i have come to embody grace so this is the you know whole uh, it's one of the ways to connect with the divine and a very, very powerful way. And I think the way which is easiest and most natural because it is embedded in creation. We have a feeling that human beings pray. Again, one of those egoistic, uh, self aggrandizing things that we all feel we are the peak of creation. But animals pray. And uh, their stories, uh, legends, which indicate that animals can pray. They are legends, you know, that an elephant and a, but they are meant to indicate. And the mother has spoken of that, that how these animals would pray. She says even when they look at human beings, human beings are like gods to them. But the classic example that prayer is embedded in creation, which means it is not that human beings pray, human beings give voice to something which is embedded in matter, matter prays is the experience we have early morning and uh, evenings you know so beautifully you said that it's six and instantly you know the whole mood morning and evening yes. nature is praying and mother has spoken of that experience tree is praying flowers pray. flowers pray flowers offer and mother has had revealed how trees came and prayed to her mother somebody is going to cut me save me Creation praise, matter praise, and the first prayer, which I, you know, it's very often people say, who was the person who first prayed? And there are beautiful lines on that. Somebody who had experienced a lot of sadness in life, he must have prayed first. No. The first prayer is the prayer which came up from the inconscient. When all the energies, the very first for beings, they fell into the darkness. And we have that prayer documented in mother's uh, prayers and meditation. When she plunges into the darkness where there is horror, falsehood, ignorance, and she says a cry came up from the darkness. Lord, come. And he gave the assurance. And we knew that the earth was saved. So this idea that human beings pray, human beings don't pray. Human beings give voice to a state which is embedded in earth. So the yoga of the earth was given when the earth came into formation. Especially because within earth there is also the psychic element. So it is earth aspiring to the supreme and we are only intermediaries. We are not really, yoga doesn't start with us. Yoga is in whole creation and it is between creation and the divine. But in human beings, the, there is a possibility of conscious yoga. So why conscious yoga? There is, uh, again, somebody asked the mother, and this question was raised in a famous studies. There have been scientific studies on prayers. For instance, one study was on locusts, which had come and destroyed some of the fields. You must have heard about it in America in some time. And there was a collective prayer. And this prayer did change things. It changed the season. And you know, that year suddenly things happened in such a way that the crops were not destroyed. But later on scientists said, no, no, there was nothing scientific about it. Uh, they attributed it to chance, as is the chance that yes. dubious garb. So then, you know, there have been studies, for instance, one famous study is God in the CCO. I mean, there are doctors, there are equipment, there are drugs, but what about God? Is he there in the coronary care unit? So there was a study on people who prayed and people who didn't pray. And most of the studies, and they are standard studies now in proper scientific field, they found that, well, those who pray have a better outcome. So then one of the critics of the study made a, you know, typical uh, 
I would say superficial remark, but something which appeals to a kind of rational mind or a skeptic mind. He says, well, why do we have to pray? God is there anyways. Why should we pray? He can do. He sees our condition. Why does he want us to pray? Somebody even asked me this question in one of the uh, famous temples in India, Nath Dwara. And he was a Swamiji and he asked this question. He said, why does God want us to pray? Meaning thereby that, you know, God must be super egoistic to want us to pray. So I said, no, no, no. God is all the time acting upon us, pouring our love and grace. When we pray, we build the bridge from our side. We yes. become receptive. It's the link. It's the link. He is wanting to put the link and we are saying, no, 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 we don't want to link. Yes. When we pray, we create a coupling. And that's what mother said when she was asked that anyways, whatever has to happen, isn't it ultimately the divine will? The mother says, yes, in a certain state of consciousness, is it true? But then because the play is in time, time and space, and through a whole field of forces, it is not that everything that happens in the world is a direct expression of the divine will. It will eventually go, but it will be through a very complex play. So the mother was asked that, uh, what is the role then of aspiration? Because ultimately, it's the divine will which at some point of time will take place. She said two things, very interesting. One, your prayer, your aspiration, of course prayer and aspiration are slightly different things, but you know, mm. well not going into the technicality of it. She says your prayer, your aspiration is also one of the instrument or one of the forces in the play. So when I say I am not going to pray, I will not aspire, divine will do whatever he wants to do. Then I am depriving the divine of the instrumentality of my own being. The second thing very interesting which she said, which I just uh, love. She said when we aspire and when we pray, Anyways, what has to happen will happen. But it adds a certain intensity to the delight that we experience and the gratitude that follows after. So every day we breathe, we live, we eat, we are provided a whole day and amazing thing is that by an act of grace we are saved. I mean it's amazing given the kind of traffic and forces and Every day we live and continue is a gratitude. But when something happens and we are saved, then we say, oh, grace was active. Now, for everyday life we don't pray. But supposing we were to pray, the mother says this, you know, that every morning we should be grateful that a day has been given to us, that there is light, there is breath. Once again we can repair our errors, and we can move towards the future with a double intensity. We can shed off the past. We can move to the future. How wonderful this gift is. So what happens when we do it? Anyways, the day has come. It has come to this whole creation. It's a free gift. But when we pray, we feel a sense of joy and gratitude, which creates a wonderful field of receptivity to receive the grace and the love which are pouring themselves on creation. But when we think of, oh, why should I pray? Anyways, the day has come. What has the divine got to do with it? As some people may do. Then we go about stumbling with life, getting a bank here, getting a bank there, and with a state which is full of torment, complaining and grumbling. Bringing the play of adverse forces. As the mother said, when you complain and grumble, adverse forces come into play. So even where there are obvious things, things which are we take for granted, how beautiful, if we add a prayer to it, and it's a prayer of thanksgiving. I love this concept. I think yes. it's yes. it's in the West. Very yes. beautiful concept. Very much. Yes. A prayer of thanksgiving. What a beautiful prayer. Mother has her own way of doing it when she is, you know, comes, you know, she is leaving the house. She says that I want to thank all these sweet little nothings which have served me so faithfully. She is praying for the objects in her house. She prays for the beings and inhabitants on the ship and in the sea. She prays for those who are suffering at the painful loss of physical separation because the Divine Mother is sailing to another shore. She is praying for their suffering. Now, This kind of a prayer where we pray 
for the whole earth, for the whole creation. In Sanskrit, this famous prayer, Sarve Bhavantu Sukhina, Sarve Santu Niramaya, Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu. So, you know, that is something which I think we should move towards that state eventually, where we are not just praying for my own liberation, which yeah. Mother speaks of as a misguided mysticism. She used the word that it's a misguided mysticism where we seek the divine for egoistic satisfaction of our personal liberation. Whereas how much more beautiful where we pray that may I come again and again be bound in 10,000 bonds if that is needed for your work. So I would be willing to be thy servitor whatever it means, whatever it costs. Still this earth is what it is, still it is not transformed into thy glorious vision. So that is the prayer which the mother teaches us. I wanted to ask you about something Arbinda Basu told me when I was very young. He showed me the prayers of the heart from the early church fathers. Right. And yes. the concentration in the heart. I have read prayer. some of them, yes. Have you? Yes, I have read. Seen. Once um, Leora had given me, ah. and they are beautiful. And uh, Shubhendra has said in the evening talks that many of the Christian mystics, they had experienced the psychic transformation. They didn't use the word, of course, and it was sufficient. Some of them, of course, some of them who wrote beautifully, they went into the overhead planes also. Great poets who had a very mystic bent in. So all over the world, human beings have, in fact, enriched this earth by this prayer. And it's thanks to the prayer of a few that many experience the delight in creation. This is also, you know, very interesting yes, yes. that many don't pray, but the some who pray, pray for, all. pray for all. And they bring that delight which comes down to touch this earth when we pray. Anyways, things will happen as the divine has decided. But when we pray, we experience that delight and as a contagion it, ex you know, matter experience it. And about prayers for others, not for oneself. Yes, yes. Yes, and the mother has said that. In fact, she would often recommend when, you know, yeah. people who were in the ashram context and their parents or somebody fell ill and they were caught up in the desire to go and help them and, you know, the deep urge to be here, right next to the Divine Mother. Who would want to leave the Divine Mother and go to see the physical mother? And while the mother and Shubhendra never made any hard and fast rule. This is very important because when we quote mother, at one point the mother said someone, let her go because you know she will feel so much at peace when her mother needs her. But at another point she has said, you know you will be of much greater help by being here and praying for her than actually going and doing something which anyways anybody else can do. Yes. So praying for others is a very very unselfish prayer and it's a very beautiful thing. And um, uh, there also, of course, we can pray for others to get this or that, which I feel we should be very, very careful because who knows we are uh, putting them in greater bondage. So it's best not to pray for that, you know. But to pray for others to be at peace. I have found this very effective. Sometimes when, you know, somebody has been angry at you, very harsh towards you, unreasonable, and you feel distraught. All of us experience these things in life. So what is the way? I have found, and of course this from Madhra and Shubhindo's guidance only, that I would come to the Samadhi and I would pray for the person's heart to be at peace. Ah. And amazingly, I would feel a liberation inside as if that whole cloud she has lifted away. <laughs> My logic was after praying for the person, I'll pray for me. That, and I should also get, and the act of praying, as if a deeper love was released from within and I discovered, you know, what Mother has said so very beautifully. Love is in every heart. Bitterness is an illusion. This is surface play. And this love is like a sunlight which melts away all this. So it's an act of love when we pray for somebody. So to the prayer we are adding an energy of love and it is very beautiful. Another thing which I have also found very interesting, say when I have done something which I feel I shouldn't have done, prayer of repentance. Mm. So very often we go and, uh, you know, tell the person, 
I'm so sorry. Sometimes we say it, you know, with guarded by the ego. Sometimes we, you know, all kinds of states. But that is not the real thing. The real thing is that we go and pray. One, that mother, I have said something which was harsh. I have done something which really now in my more healthier state, harmonious state, uh, quieter state, I know I should not have. Mother, I pray that may the consequences on that person and on me may not be there. Second, this part in me which acted so foolishly, so rashly, Mother, please help this part come out of this error and ignorance. Show it the light, show it the way. And I have seen this is very beautiful. It helps even, even you know, break the acrimony which is going on mm. between people. Because naturally when one has spoken, uh, you know, speech can do so much harm in this world. As human beings, you know, speech has been like everything else, a double-edged weapon. You know, there are people who pray for the bad of others. So horrible. Uh, fortunately, with the Divine Mother, it doesn't work like that. This is a very interesting story. Of course, there are ignorant gods, what are called in Tantra as Shudra Devta, mm. whom one prays and invokes to destroy others. Mm. And But with Mother, it's very interesting. <laughs> when somebody disliked uh, a couple of you know people whatever that background is not important and prayed uh, ha for harm to come to these people and saw that they are prospering more and more <laughs> and doing better and better so he couldn't help but ask the mother mother i've been praying for this they have done so much harm to me and uh, you know what is it they seem to prosper <laughs> mother said very interestingly that look by praying to me, you are bringing their consciousness in contact with mine. What do you expect to happen? <laughs> you think that I am going to harm them? And you know, why I am mentioning this, it's so sad. At least I find it very sad. When people say, you know, mother punished him. He developed an illness because he did this. He died because of this. Mother punished. What have we reduced her to? A tribunal of justice, Shobinda in one of the letters mm -hmm. says, we are not a tribunal of justice. And we reduce it. It is the most, you know, I always say don't reduce mother to this. She is nothing but love. Love and grace, love and grace. We may not receive it rightly. We may do all kinds of stupid things. But she is love and grace. Yet people say, yeah. you must have heard it, I have heard it and when I heard even a little time back, maybe a year or two years back, honestly, uh, I have seen so much in life, I don't get shocked. But this did, you know, I did feel shocked. I said, here? Yeah. After all this, yeah. one still believes mother punished him, mother punished her. Despite so much they have written about it. Even her rejections are not rejections but postponements. Because she is full of compassion. Thank you so much. I just love this.